All right, we can uh, maybe get started. So it's a pleasure to have uh, Professor Chung Li Lu today from CMU. Um, Nira will provide an introduction to Chung Lu, but we wanted to welcome you on behalf of the Center for Innovation and Control Optimization and Networks here at Purdue. This is a relatively new center. It's about two years uh, old now, but um, it brings together uh, faculty from across the College of Engineering and across Purdue. We're broadly interested in the themes of control optimization networks, autonomous systems, human autonomy interaction. Uh, so we're having this uh, themed seminar series this fall. So we're really happy that you could join us uh, as part of this. Um, so I'll turn it over to Nira um, to introduce you. Sure, and thanks, Trace. And I apologize. I, I um, maybe if you can tell everybody a little bit more icon about Icon. I need maybe just a, a couple more seconds. Um, I'm having trouble retrieving what I was looking for on my computer. I uh, decided to really not cooperate at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we have sixty over sixty faculty, right? So uh, within the College of Engineering, we've got folks from ECE, mechanical, civil, industrial, um, ag, bio. Uh, essentially all, um, all, all the engineering uh, departments and as well as computer science and uh, polytechnic, which is more on the robotic side of, of things. Um, so yeah, we've got um, folks that are working on, like I said, multi-agent systems, human autonomous uh, interaction, security uh, of multi-agent systems and so forth. Um, so yeah, I can, Nir, I can even go ahead and introduce uh, Professor Liu if you don't have access. Wonderful, to that. that would be great, thank you. Okay. Thanks, yeah, so uh, Dr. Liu is an assistant professor in the Robotics Institute uh, School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon, uh, where she leads the Intelligent Control Lab. Uh, prior to joining CMU, Dr. Liu was a postdoc at Stanford. Uh, she received her PhD from the University of California at Berkeley and her bachelor's in engineering and economics from Tsinghua. Uh, her research interests are in the design and verification of intelligent systems with applications to manufacturing and transportation. Uh, she's published a book, Designing Robo Robot Behavior and Human-Robot Interactions, with CRC Press in 2019, and she's received many Best Paper Awards, uh, including a, and a Rising Star in EECS, an Amazon Research Award, a Ford URP Award, and, and, uh, and others. So it's a real pleasure to have you here again, uh, Chung Lu, so I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction. It's my great pleasure to um, share with you some of our recent work in this uh, new center. So the, uh, the title for my talk is Safe Control and Learning for Efficient Human-Robot Interactions. Um, so the general background of my work is to investigate how can we make robots to work and collaborate safely with humans. And those robots include industrial collaborative robots, which can collaboratively um, finish some industrial tasks with humans, or those can be autonomous vehicles that interact with all kinds of road participants when they drive on public roads. Yeah, but today I'm mainly going to focus on the first kind of robot, industrial collaborative robot. So what are the challenges in order to bring human and robots together in manufacturing floors? The major challenge is how to ensure safety and their uncertainty. We definitely do not want the robot to hurt human. We also don't want the robot to be too conservative as the conventional or the nowadays uh, safety measure is just to slow down the robot and even stop the robot when a human gets close. That is definitely not ideal as the robot will not be of much usefulness if they do this conservative behavior. And what we are looking for is to make sure that the humans and the robots can efficiently and safely collaborate with, with each other in close proximity. And uh, in today's talk, I will mainly discuss how we enable this kind of scenario to come true. For example, how we enable a robot to jointly do some manipulation with human. For example, this is clean the table. And all of these um, bring us to the design objectives and the design challenges. So the design objective for those kind of human robot system is that we should not only ensure safety, but also try to maximize efficiency within the safety constraint. And the constraints that we have during the design for the robot behavior are that we have uncertainties in the system, that human behaviors are highly unpredictable and the time varying and also can be affected by the robot behavior. So how can we deal with those uncertainties during the controller design is a huge problem. And the second is that the robot needs to generate real-time response to the humans and the two task needs. Then how can we make sure the robot can finish those computation in real time under very limited computation capacity. So just to provide you some general uh, like a, uh, cost, usually a industrial robot costs about 10K to 20K. 
and a very powerful GPU is also 10K to 20K. So it's, it's insane to uh, equip those um, very expensive GPU with those industrial robots. So how can we use those existing onboard computation to achieve real-time and efficient response? That is also a challenge. Yeah, so that's the overall big picture for our research. Uh, but today I'm mainly going to focus on uh, addressing the safety and the uncertainty. For the efficiency kind of work, we have done a lot of um, research on how we do this hierarchical planning that decouple efficiency at different layers. So then we can uh, make sure that we can uh, balance the task performance uh, while uh, make sure that we can generate response in real time. And then for the computation, we have developed a bunch of real-time optimization algorithms to make sure the robot can generate response in real time under very limited computation capacity. Yeah, and uh, the, today's focus is on safety, like how we can generate provably safe control and how we can make those safe control act more efficiently, not conservatively in the real application. And the second is when there are large uncertainties about human behaviors, how can we better learn human behaviors so that we can do robust prediction in real time. Okay, and the other work that I'm going to discuss today is under this framework called Safe and Efficient Robot Collaborative System, which is a project supported by NSF, started while I was doing my PhD at Berkeley. Yeah, so in this system, we have three modules for the robot controller. Uh, the first module is to do environment monitoring. That is, we have a cognition model library to uh, record different kinds of human behaviors. And then in real time, once we collect the human trajectory, we'll infer what a human is doing and also try to adapt the offline learned model to that specific human. And after we get that, we uh, do the task planning based on the human's needs. And in the task planning part, we have a bunch of motion skills in the robot motion library. Uh, for example, pick up how to grasp certain uh, objects, how to insert, how to do the assembly, how to do cable manipulation. All of them are in, encoded in those skill library. And then once we figure out what the task for the robot is, we can then uh, do the task planning uh, according to the skill library. And once we have finished both modules, we then send all the information to the motion and trajectory planning as well as control part. And the, the safety constraints encoded in the motion and the control, motion planning and control part. Yeah, and after that, the motion command will be sent to the robot hardware. So here is a demonstration that apply this camera system in this human robot collaborative desktop assembly. So the robot is actively monitoring the human behavior, yeah. So after the human put this fan uh, or put this hard disk into this uh, desktop, the robot infer that a human may need a screwdriver to fasten that assembly and then it will pick up the screwdriver and then uh, hand it over to the human hook for human to finish the task. So that's the overall framework and uh, today um, in the first half of this talk, I will talk about how how we do the safe control given all the information that is already generated by higher level. And then I will talk about how we can generate robust prediction in real time about different human behaviors. Yeah, and the, finally, I will talk about some of our recent work on this uh, learning of diverse motion skills. Okay, so first part of the work, uh, safe control. I will uh, mainly focus on the energy function based safe control idea. So. If you uh, work in control theory, then you probably will be very familiar with this kind of energy function based type of control. It's used a lot to prove stability, reachability. The key idea is that we should always design a system states to have low energy and then design a system control strat strategy to ensure energy dissipation. So then if that control strategy is applied, we'll eventually converge to our desired state according to this energy dissipation. Yeah, so an and illustration is shown here. Yeah, so once we re release that ball, the ball will eventually go to this low energy part. Yeah, and this kind of idea is widely used in Lyapunov type of analysis, uh, in value function, in barrier function, and also in hyper stability and the passivity 
uh, passivity kind of analysis. And then we're going to use this kind of idea to ensure safety. Um, but before we apply that idea, let's first look at what is the exact safety specification we want to ensure in this system. So we assume that our safe, safety specification is a hard constraint on the state space. That is the robot needs to make sure the system state that include both robot state and the human state stays in a constraint set denoted as XS. Yeah, so um, under this safety specification, we have two problems to address. First problem is called forward invariance. That is, if the system's initial state starts inside a safe set, can we design a control law to ensure that the system will never leave the safe set? That is to make the boundary of the safe set repulsive. And the second problem is, if we start from outside the safe set, can we guarantee that safe system can go back to the safe set in finite amount of time? So this problem is also called as finite convergence problem. And the, these two problems can both be addressed by this energy uh, function based idea in, in the sense that we can just design an energy function uh, which achieves low value when the state is inside the safe set and high value when the state is uh, outside the safe set. And uh, by letting the system to be energy dissipation, dissipating, then we can guarantee forward invariance and finite time convergence. Yeah, but that's very abstract math. Let's now look at one example on how we apply that idea to human robot systems. And uh, here we just let the safe set to denote the collision avoidance constraint. So we consider the real world situation as shown on the left, where a human may collaborate with a large robot arm. And in order to ease the computation, because the geometry of the human and the geometry of the robot is very complicated, in order to ease the computation, we build a simplified computation model, uh, which uses those capsules, standard geometry capsules, to wrap all the robot link and the human body. And then we can post the safety constraint as the following, which requires that any capsule on the robot body, uh, the distance from any capsule on the ro robot body to any capsule on the human body should be greater than or equal to some threshold gamma. Okay, so that, that is our safety constraint. And uh, if this is ensured, then we have the collision avoidance between human and robot. Then how can we use an energy function type of idea to enforce this constraint, uh, which will be illustrated in the following slides. But essentially this constraint is defined in a very high dimensional space because both the robot state and human state are high dimensional. In order to illustrate this, better illustrate this high dimensional space, we reduce it to 2D where the horizontal axis is the robot state, vertical axis, the human state, and the um, uh, states that satisfy this constraint is shown in the blue area, which usually is non-convex. So if we, so suppose our current state is on the boundary of the safe set, if we detect that the human may have some movement towards the upper part, then the robot should generate an action to pull the system back in order to stay safe. So that, that's uh, an kind of control idea. And then how can we generalize that to energy function type of idea? Uh, the approach is just to define this energy function at top of this state space, such that the level set of that energy function is a subset of, um, of this originally user-defined safe set, this blue area. And uh, here in particular, we call this energy function as a safety index. So with this energy function, then we can very easily check whether our control is safe or not. So for example, all the control, uh, of course, this control also is combined with human control. So both human control and robot control. If the combined behavior is moving the system state above the sub-level set, then it's an unsafe uh, behavior. And if the control is to move the system down uh, into the sub-level set, then it's a safe behavior. And uh, then this kind of constraint can be easily written as a constraint on the, on the control input of the system. Suppose we have a uh, control affine system for the human robot joint states. 
So X contains both the human state and robot state, but the control U uh, here we assume only contains the robot control. So the dynamics is shown as this X dot equal to FX plus GX U, where the human control can appear both in FX or GX here. And as we said, we can use the sign of this energy function to decide whether the uh, behavior is safe or not. And the sign is, uh, or the change of the energy function is denoted as this phi dot, which equals to LF phi plus LG phi multiplying U. And uh, those LG phi and LF phi are lead derivatives. So then the constraint on the safety index that phi dot should not point in the system above the sublevel set this constraint can be turned into a constraint on the control through this relationship. And uh, very interestingly, if this system is affine, control affine, then the control uh, constraint, resulting control constraint is a half space constraint, which is easy, very easy to compute. So an illustration is shown here. Suppose we have a control space and uh, this is the origin. Then this set of safe control constraint is a half space whose normal direction is along this uh, lead derivative LG phi, which tells us what is the safest direction or the steepest descent along the safest direction. There's a perpendicular direction uh, that is perp perpendicular to this LG phi. This term does not affect our safety. Hence, we can do something about this term to make the system still behave efficiently. So this is the general idea about how we design the safe control. And though after we get this kind of half space constraint on the control space, we can directly apply this half space control constraint on top of any nominal control we have. Those nominal control can be some learning controller, some PID controller, or even MPC controller. And the idea is fairly straightforward. We can just do a projection from the nominal control to the set of safe control that we have found earlier that's complying with the safety constraint. And we can do this by doing this uh, quadratic pro uh, projection. Okay, up to now, if you are familiar with those control barrier function type of approach to ensure safety, you might find this is very similar to those approach. Yeah, but the um, point I want to claim here is that control barrier function based approach is just one type of energy function based control. And uh, they have a unique way to choose how they pose the constraint. So for example, their constraint is always posed as phi dot smaller than negative lambda phi. But there are also other methods that will pose the constraint differently. For example, potential field method, they do not do the quadratic projection. They just add a fairly large descent along the gradient phi to modify the nominal control. And also a sliding mode type of approach um, add a very large descent along the LG phi direction. And also in our previous work, we have introduced a bunch of algorithms, for example, the safe set algorithm, uh, where we also do the quadratic type of uh, projection, but we do not try to enforce any constraint when the robot is already in a safe state. Yeah, so if this phi is smaller than zero, then there's no constraint. If the safety is about to be violated, then we add a constraint. Oops. Oh, yeah. And uh, we have compared all these approaches on this simple human-robot interaction case, where this blue dot is, uh, blue circle is controlled by a human through uh, like a trackpad. And uh, this robot arm is running on um, these algorithms shown here. And then we generate a bunch of random seeds for this kind of situation. And uh, for each trial, we record the final safety score and uh, the efficiency score. Efficiency score is how many dots those system can achieve. And safety score is how far away the robot is from the humans throughout the whole process. So the safety is always guaranteed for all the methods in the sense that there's no collision. But uh, as for how, how far away the robot can be away from the human, that's different. As we can see, um, these four methods generate very different trade-offs as shown in this figure. And uh, for the case that um, the safety score is higher, the CBF method generates lower efficiency score. And for the case that the uh, 
safety score is lower, the our method um, generates higher efficiency score, the SSA method. And the reason after analyzing the detailed performance is actually because of the different ways of enforcing the constraint. So because in CDF, they enforce the constraint everywhere, even when it is safe. So then it is losing some of the efficiency in the safe part. And in our method, although we do not enforce constraint when it is safe, but there's the jumping of the constraint. So that chattering also brings some problem. And uh, so then after this analysis, we propose this new algorithm called sublevel safe set algorithm, which essentially combines the constraint of CVF and our method in the sense that we do not enforce any constraint when it is safe. And uh, when we want to enforce constraint, we enforce a smooth constraint that is that has does not have this chattering effect. And after that, when we run this experiment, we can see our new methods, this purple one, outperforms both ex the existing methods. And we believe this is a good way for us to analyze safety and efficiency of different systems and uh, improve the hyperparameter design. Okay, and uh, so for our method, we have applied it widely on different hardware systems. And here we're going to hear the video is showing one application on this robot arms. So this robot arm is trying to avoid this obstacle, pink obstacle. Uh, at the same time, move this black workpiece towards this green box. Now, as we can see, the robot is constantly changing the trajectory with the help of our safe control. Yeah, and the, because the safe control do this quadratic programming approach, which essentially can have some analytical solution by approximation. And uh, that analytical solution can be run very efficiently online. In this example, it is running at 1000 Hertz. Cool, so that's basically the general framework of how to do the safe control. Yeah, but nowadays, as we get more and more complicated systems, uh, there are still a lot of challenges that need to be addressed. So for example, in a lot of cases, we may not explicitly know the system dynamics, but in order to apply safe control, as we saw earlier in the derivation, we need to know the dynamic equation and the dynamic equation need to be control affine. But in a lot of cases, we might only have a non-control affine digital twin simulator or a learned non-control affine neural network model. In those cases, how can we perform safe control? Um, even without an explicit control affine dynamics. That's a key issue that we are trying to address now. And uh, in order to address this problem, we need to break the safe control synthesis into more details. Essentially the safe control synthesis include two parts. The, part, the first part is this question one. That is uh, how can we design a safety index or the energy function? such that we always have a feasible safe control given the control limit. And the second is how, if we get this energy function, then how can we compute the safe control in real time so that the robot can generate real time response? Yeah, so the uh, synthesis part, we haven't touched a lot, uh, but the idea is showing this figure. Um, we need to figure out a very good energy function such that the constraint, which is shown uh, on every, every state here. So we choose four state examples. If the state is already safe, we don't add any constraints. So all the areas are blue, that is feasible. And uh, if the uh, state is outside the safe area, we need to add some constraint. And the state is on the boundary, then we need to make sure it does not exceed the safe area. And once we have the constraint on the, on the state, uh, then we can map that constraint through your dynamics back to the control space. Now, after we map that to the control space, we got those blue area in the control space, but we need to make sure that if we have limitations on the control, for example, saturations, um, we still have an intersection between those safe controls and the feasible controls such that we can choose uh, a valid control in real time. If the indexes or energy function is not properly synthesized, we might not have that control. Okay, so we are going to discuss our recent approaches to address these two concerns. Uh, the second one is easier to address. So let's discuss the second one. The second one essentially is to, to say, once we already have a valid energy function, how can we do the computation in real time? This quadratic mapping in real time. 
uh, even though we don't have an explicit control affine function f. Yeah, so this, although it looks very complicated, but if we take a deeper look, we can see that this function is a convex function so that the optimal solution must always lie on the boundary of the constraint. And then it makes the problem easier. We can just directly do a black box optimization from the reference control. That is to generate a few search directions and a check if any of the search direction will touch the boundary of the safe control constraint. So for example, in this case, we get two control that touches the boundary and we can just pick one that minimizes the cost. Although there is some approximation error, but this algorithm can be run very efficiently online. And uh, we have presented this results in Coral earlier this, this week. Okay, so that's how to address the problem of real-time computation when we don't have an explicit uh, model. And the second is how can we synthesize a valid energy function such that there always exists a safe control. And the condition is that the set of safe control intersects with the control constraint. It's always non-empty. And in order to address that, we can essentially formulate the problem as the following minimax problem. That is, we can find the state such that the area between the area of the intersection between the safe control and the feasible control is minimized. And then we try to find an index to maximize this minimal area. And if we can solve this minimization, then we can get a feasible, and such that this minimum value is above zero, then we can get a valid energy function. And uh, in the following example, I'm going to show one approach to solve this minimization problem. That is first to parameterize the index and then optimize the parameters inside this index uh, by directly doing this minimization, uh, doing this uh, minimax optimization. And uh, this example is in the vehicle collision avoidance where we have a vehicle model, but it's not interpretable by human. We know it's a second order model but everything is encoded in deep neural networks. So we do not have the explicit parameters. And then we have a safety constraint that is to require that the vehicle does not collide with this obstacle. And then we parameterize the safety index as the following. Yeah, the, why we should parameterize it like that is because we have proved in our pre previous work that if we parameterize like that, then we can guarantee, uh, and uh, if we can select the parameters, such that the set of safe control is always not empty, then we can ensure the safe sets is for invariant. So it's good. Yeah, and then in the following discussion, we are going to show the how this uh, minimax optimization will choose the parameters. One parameter is the constant margin, and the one parameter is the order of this um, zeros order constraint. And uh, the other is this k multiplying d dot. So how this optimization will modify these parameters such that we can guarantee that at every state, we always have a feasible safe control. Yeah, so we use this uh, face graph to do this illustration. In this face graph, the horizontal axis is the original index phi zero, vertical axis is phi zero dot. Yeah, so if we use the naive original constraint phi equal to the mean minus d, then the phi smaller than zero is this half space, green half space. And um, this has some problem mainly because- if Thank we you. Are, oh, oh, yes. Oh, okay. So if we are on this um, positive parts of uh, phi zero equal to zero, but phi zero dot is greater than zero, then it's, we, we don't have any approach to bring the system back towards the safe area because if we are on this state two, uh, because the system is, second order system. So we can, not, we can only affect acceleration, but not the velocity. And now the velocity is positive. So then 
even though we can add a large acceleration, but the system will first go to the unsafe region and then come back. That is not a desired behavior. And because of that, when we check if X2 has any safe control, we find there's no safe control. Yeah, but after this first step of minimax optimization, we get to a different set of parameters as shown here. And with these parameters, we can see now every state, every sample state has a feasible safe control that US has some intersection with this omega. And if we further optimize it, we can see this, although in the second case, we have some safe control, but this safe control set is fairly small. Yeah, but after continual optimization, we can ensure that the safe control set is being enlarged. And this is good. If we have some uncertainty, then we have more choices to make the system stay safe. And all of these do not require explicit understanding or analytical uh, expression of the model. As long as we can query the model, then we can perform this kind of optimization in order to get a feasible function. Yeah, and uh, after that, after we get this um, energy function, we can just plug that energy function into this um, optimization problem and then use the black box optimization to solve it at every time step. And uh, the final trajectory is shown here. So no matter how we place the obstacles, the vehicle can always safely avoid all these obstacles. And uh, with that synthesized energy function and that black box optimization, we can also wrap the corresponding safety controller um, and uh, use that to safeguard a deep reinforcement learning algorithm. So this is our recent result that is reported in Coral earlier this, this week. That is, if we do that, we can guarantee, even though we do not know what model it is in, in the actual system, but since we can cure the model in, uh, and use that curate result to synthesize the index, then our synthesized index and our safe control algorithm can always guarantee zero violation during the training, while all the other state of the art methods, although they can uh, minimize the safety violation, but they cannot always drive the violation to zero. And also with our methods, we can make sure that the, even if the safety is violated, we can drive the violated states back to the safe state that is below zero in finite amount of steps. Okay, so that's how we can do the safe control. And that is the bottom layer of our whole system. And um, in order to do the safe control, as we said earlier, we need to have some description about how the system will evolve. And uh, that evolution of the system also includes how the human will, will uh, behave. Uh, in the near future. And in order to get a good human model, we need to do some learning and make sure that we can learn a good model that can fit individual behaviors as well as time varying behaviors of individual humans. And now we're going to show how can we do that. Um, yeah, and the, those understanding of humans also affects the conver conservativeness of our safe control because a uh, more accurate understanding will reduce the uncertainty range. And as a result, we can access larger area that is safe. Um, but if we have larger uncertainties, then the safe area is smaller and we need to be more conservative in order to stay safe. So for the human model learning and human prediction, the general pipeline is shown here. So we first collect a bunch of human data and then throw those data into some model learning algorithm, which can be any, any desired supervised learning approach. And then we get a prediction model. This model can take the historical human trajectory and generate an intention prediction or a direct tra tra trajectory prediction of the human in real time. Yeah, and then, yeah. So then we can use this model for the real-time prediction. But the problem with this process is that how can we make sure that the human data we get will always align with the real-time measurement we'll get when we use this model? 
this is actually very hard to, to ensure because there are always distribution shift. For example, we might encounter different human subjects or through the interaction, the human's behavior may, change, may be changed by the robot, by interacting with the robot. And then in order to deal with that distribution shift, it is not ideal to collect massive amount of data or it's actually also too expensive to do that. So we need to design more intelligent algorithms to deal with this kind of distribution shift. Yeah, so here we are going to discuss two kinds of solutions. One solution is to use online adaptation, that is to adapting our model online in order to mitigate the distribution shift. And the second approach is to do targeted data augmentation, that is to understand what is the most necessary data that we need to be at, uh, that need to be added to the system and then uh, just add those target data without doing extensive experiment again. Okay, so for the first approach, the human model adaptation, uh, these kind of adaptation will be very necessary, especially when we deal with human because human has 10 varying behaviors that their behavior may change due to fatigue, due to the interaction with the robots. And also different human subjects may have different behaviors. And if we do online adaptation, uh, a good kind of side effect is that usually the adaptation algorithm will help us to quantify the uncertainty online so that we can use the uncertainty to shape our control. Yeah, and the, here is a video showing the comparison between two human motion prediction case. Left is without adaptation, right is with adaptation. So we can focus on this elbow prediction. Um, as we can see with adaptation, the elbow prediction is much more accurate. But why is that the case? That is mainly because in our data set, there are some human that tends to lift the arm and some human tends to rest the arm on the table. So then the model learned an average behavior. And then after online adaptation, this for this human, the model realized that this human tends to rest their uh, elbow on the, on the table. And uh, after understanding that the prediction is much more accurate than previous. Okay, so essentially how this adaptation is done algorithm wise, it is showing the following slide. Suppose we have some offline model, uh, sorry, suppose we have some ground truth model first that maps the previous state of human to the future state. And then we can build a prediction model and parameterize that mapping using some parameter theta. In the k minus one step, we can use that model to generate a prediction. And then in the k time step, we can get the true measurement and then compare that true measurement with our prediction and then go through some adaptation mechanism. Sorry, go through some adaptation mechanism and uh, generate some modification of our model parameter and then use the new model to do our prediction again. And then we can repeat this process again and again during the online execution. And then you may wonder what kind of algorithm can we use to do the adaptation? And essentially any algorithm that can help us to transform the state prediction error to parameter update, we can then use it for adaptation. So most common methods are gradient-based methods, which is uh, stochastic gradient descent, Adam and S. Gret, or second order Newton based methods, which include recursive least square, extended common filter, or modified extended common filter. We have compared both these two types of approaches and find that both approaches, as long as we have adaptation, we can definitely achieve a better performance that is smaller error compared to without adaptation. And in general, second order approach will achieve better adaptation result. That is mainly because those Newton-based methods are better for, uh, for the optimization when we are already very close to the local optima. And uh, when, because the model is already well-trained offline, even though there are some small variations online, we're still very close to the local optima. So then second order methods 
gives us this very fast convergence. While gradient-based method is good to do the training from scratch, but may not necessarily be good for those small modifications. Yeah, but definitely in order to make those second order method works, especially safely take the inverse of the hashing in those second methods, we still need to do some tricks. For example, adding some smoothing effects or forgetting effects to make sure that we have a, a, the inverse of the hashing does not blow up. Okay, and uh, here is some results that we um, generated for the adaptation with that human arm prediction you have seen in a previous slide. And then we compare our adaptation approach with respect to all the other, uh, or most of the other state of the art uh, human arm prediction approaches. And the R method is shown in the thick red curve. As we can see, our method achieves the best performance in all kinds of scenarios. And also it's worth pointing out that um, for a different human subject doing the same task, if you can see the error is usually about um, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 meters. So it's actually kind of big for models without adaptation. For our with adaptation, it's, it's several centimeters, which is still good. But for the case that we have same subject doing different tasks, all the models will give small errors, which is on the 10 to the negative two order, which is much smaller than the other case. That is to say, um, different human subjects may require more adaptation. And it's more likely that if we haven't seen a, the new human subject before in the data set, then the model, if we do not do adaptation, will not generate desirable performance. But it, it should be fine if we have seen that human, but it's just a human doing a different task. The uh, learned model may still be relatively good even without adaptation. Okay, so this is the first approach that is to use the real-time measurement to adapt our prediction model. And there's a second approach that is we can directly augment our data to make sure that before we deploy the prediction model, there's already some, some guarantee that it can transfer to certain type of distributions that we might see online. And how can we do this? So we are going to use this human intention prediction as one example. So in the um, human robot collaborative assembly, we usually need to identify what the human wants to do next so that the robot can then do plan its action accordingly. And in this case, we just predict what's the next object the human wants to pick and whether the human wants to do assembly or uh, just to uh, reach some part or just to retrieve some part. Yeah, so these are different labels and we want to be sure that we can correctly predict those labels so that the robot can generate corresponding behaviors. But this prediction problem is actually not that trivial, um, especially the learning can, can be screwed due to many reasons. And here we summarize two major reasons that can make the learning inaccurate. The first reason is that the labels for different actions may be highly imbalanced in our data set. So for example, when the human is doing assembly uh, or doing this um, task as shown in the video, the actual assembly time that is putting different pieces together may be much longer than the time the human is trying to retrieve or reach some object. And because of that, the model accuracy, if we naively throw the whole trajectory that we collect uh, from this human behavior to our model, then because of this imbalance, the model accuracy for assembly label will be much higher than the other labels, which is definitely not good. And then the second source of inaccuracy is the noisy measurement. So in our work, we first use a uh, human detection module to extract the human wrist from the video. 
and the, those extraction algorithm and, as well as the uh, camera hardware itself contains a lot of noises. So although the ground truth of the human may be this red curve, uh, red dots, but the measured trajectory may be this purple dot. And this noisy measurement add another layer of difficulty in the into this classification task. And the both of these will generally lead to very poor decision boundaries. That is, uh, the, hum the robot may not have a very clear understanding about how to differentiate different intentions. And the, based on this understanding, then we can, we argue that the most important data that we should add to our model should be those most confusing data on the current decision boundary of our model. Yeah, so for example, if we do a very naive 2D classification where the ground truth is shown here, there, ha there are two labels and then we get a bunch of data and then we train a model. The learned model is shown here. So as we can see, although it can get most of the clusters correct, but the boundaries are not so accurate. And if we have some disturbance on the boundary, then the results, the classification results may change dramatically, which is not desired. So then we essentially need to add more data on the boundary because those are most confusing to us at the current moment. And once we add those data, then we can train the model to be more robust. Yeah, and the, for example, we can add the data for these three white dots. Yeah, although we can identify those three white dots on the boundary, but the problem is how can we know the ground truth label for those data? And in order to get the ground truth label, we can essentially ask the human expert to do the labeling again. In the human robot case, uh, this kind of labeling is essentially to look at a synthetic image of human doing certain task. And uh, then uh, we ask the human experts to say, when you see this synthetic video, uh, what do you think this human is doing? And uh, we use that information to label that data and then add it back to the data set. And then we can iteratively do this as shown here, iteratively find more samples on the boundary and uh, label those samples and add it back to the training. And eventually we will get a converging result towards the ground truth. Okay, yeah, and uh, for the human, applying this kind of idea on human intention classification. As we said earlier, it's just to look at those synthetic uh, trajectory on this image and then ask human to do the labeling. And they essentially, how to mathematically solve this boundary finding problem, we can pose it as a perturbation problem to some existing data point. That is for all the existing data points, we can uh, try to perturb that and see if within certain perturbation boundary epsilon, can we get a different label on using the current model parameter? If we can, then that means that place that states that we get the different label is a state on the boundary and we can add that state back to our model and redo the training again. And uh, if we have a very complicated deep neural network to model uh, uh, for the modeling, this kind of computation may not be very efficient. But luckily, we have a toolbox in order to do this kind of uh, perturbation and the computation over deep neural networks. And essentially, in this toolbox, there are three different kind of approaches for you to compute the decision boundary with respect to a uh, deep neural network. First approach is to do reachability. That is, um, if we have some input point and we, we check if it's epsilon neighborhood all have the same label by propagating this input set layer by layer through the neural network. And if the label changes, then we'll get, we'll see from, see the change from the reachable set and then we know it and we can um, backtrack to get that point. Or we can directly do the optimization that is, suppose we confine our point in the epsilon neighborhood of our current data point and enforce the output of that point to generate a different label. 
And then if we can find that point, then this point will be added to our data set. And uh, to solve this kind of complicated optimization constraint with deep neural networks, we can sometimes relax the activation function to some convex function to speed up the computation. And the last kind of approach is to do direct search. That is to kind of do branch and bound, breaking the epsilon neighborhood of the current point into smaller regions and check if those smaller regions contain different uh, labels. And uh, if we do not find, we can then do the partition again and again. Okay, and with that, this will give us the whole architecture of our iterative adversarial data augmentation approach. So there's a lot of things going on on this figure, but the idea is straightforward. We start from a training data, do some network training, after we get the network parameters, we do some, uh, this formal verification is to run the previous three algorithms, reachability, optimization, and search to find those most confusing input points to our current model. Once we find those most confusing points, we ask human to do the labeling. And after the labeling, we can augment the data either to the adversarial data sets if we believe it's just a noisy data or directly to the training data set if we believe it contains meaningful information. And we can keep doing that. And uh, the overall result is that you will lead us to a converging training result. Uh, especially, that is especially helpful when we try to understand human behaviors with very limited initial training data. Now here's a result with respect to this approach. Um, so we compared our approach with respect to conventional supervised training, that is no data augmentation at all, and adversarial training, that is to only do this augmentation without human labeling. As we can see, our methods performs much better than the others, and the, the most important thing is that it can continuously improve the accuracy while the other methods may overfit. So as a comparison, our method, the main difference between our method and the conventional adversarial training is that adversarial training may contain a lot of false adversaries. That is, although we think the label should change, but the label shouldn't change at that point. And because of those false adversaries, um, the learning accuracy may drop in the end. But since in our method, we use human to do the labeling. So then a human can detect those false adversaries accurately and uh, avoid that false adversaries to pollute our data set. Yeah, and uh, use that approach doing the offline training, we can guarantee that our method has certain robustness and we can use that robustness to estimate our confidence of human prediction online. The idea is to, to check given the current prediction, how large the error bound is. So error bound means how, how much we can perturb the trajectory such that it remains the same prediction of the same intention. If the error bound is big, then that means we're much more confident. If the error bound is smaller, that means that we are less confident. And we can use that to uh, provide a evaluation of our prediction online and then incorporate that results into the subsequent modules. Okay, so that's the two approaches. Oh, we are almost out of time. Let me just quickly go over the future vision. So that's how we can do the safe control and uh, the uh, human modeling. And the currently we're mostly focused on the two construction of the two libraries, how to make sure that human can understand very uh, the robot can understand very diverse human behaviors and also how can we make sure that the robot uh, can do very uh, diverse skills, for example, different kind of assembly skills in manufacturing. And in order to do that, we believe we definitely need to have more intelligence behind, uh, beyond safety. So we have shown approaches to understand human intentions, but how can we understand active human commands is still a question. Especially those commands may come not come from keyboard or um, language or conventional type of input devices. Then how can we understand those commands? Those may be gestures or stuff like that. And once we understand the commands, how can we properly respond 
to the human's needs. And uh, after that, how can we equip the robot with very diverse skill sets? And also, if the skill sets cannot be diverse enough to cover the current task, how can we learn new skills through interactions? And these are all the directions that we are currently exploring. And I just want to show the last slide here. That is to use dynamic gestures to manipulate robots in order for it to achieve more dexterity. Yeah, so the reason why we want to use dynamic gestures is that it is contact free. So if we are handling some dangerous or heavy materials, then we don't need to worry about contacting the robots. And also, if we are using some kind of um, those teleoperate devices, the degree of freedom usually cannot fully match the degree of freedom for the robot. And sometimes it's not intuitive. And also the command are fixed, not very flexible. But if we use dynamic gestures, it can be easily adapted to different human subjects and also can be personalized to different human subjects. Yeah, and uh, we are currently developing this kind of technology. So here are two examples. One is doing this, oops. One is doing this uh, soldering task and the other is doing the inspection task. So the dynamic gesture for translation motion is usually straightforward. To, to do, like you just move your hand. But the most difficult part is those rotation actions because you cannot understand the rotation action from single image. You need to connect multiple images together in order to understand, okay, the human wants me to rotate. And uh, we, are developed, we developed a probabilistic method for robot to properly understand that and uh, fo correctly follow the human motion. Okay, so I guess that's everything I want to present today. In the end, I want to uh, acknowledge our sponsors and all the students that supported this work. And then here are some data set and the algorithms if you're interested. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thanks so much, Chang Wu. That was uh, really nice. Um, we can open it up for a couple of short questions at this time. Anybody has any questions they'd like to ask, or you can type in the chat. I guess while we're waiting, I had one quick question, which was, um, are you assuming bounds on the human behavior? So for example, if the human does something crazy um, or moves faster than the robot can move away, um, those kinds of things would certainly violate the safety constraints, presumably. So are there um, assumptions on the human models? Yeah, so for now we use human bounds like acceleration limit and the velocity limit to design our safe control. And because the robot can react very efficiently, so the current control is 1000 hertz, although the perception is 30 hertz, but within 30 hertz and within the acceleration and the velocity limits, the human cannot move too much. And we use that information to bound the robot behavior. Sorry, thanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there any other quick question? If not, uh, we'll, let's thank our speaker, Professor Liu, uh, for a wonderful talk. Thank you so much, Professor Liu. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I believe you would have gotten a Zoom link from Nira um, for your meetings with individual faculty. Um, and so we'll jump over to that Zoom room so you can start your meetings there. Yeah, sounds good. Wonderful. I'll see you there. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Bye. Hi, Chen Lee. This is Nira. I'm so sorry that I wasn't, um, uh, I'm not able to attend any of those meetings. I just want to let you know I have to head off to teach. Um, but if you have any challenges getting into that room, just let Shreyas know. Yeah, sure. No problem. And uh, Awesome. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for coming.